Thank you, Dr. Bhavna. Thank you for making me part of this course. And I think these are very relevant topics, which are very important uh, in managing different corneal conditions. So I'll be talking about uh, the corneal emergencies associated with corneal transplantation. I have no financial disclosure. If we look at the corneal transplantation, past two decades we have witnessed a shift from full thickness penetrating keratoplasty to lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, looking at the statistics worldwide, we will see that now more and more people perform uh, either anterior lamellar keratoplasty such as DALK or a posterior lamellar keratoplasty such as uh, DSEC or DMEC or ultra thin DSEC. And if we look at the survival curves of these various graphs, we see that definitely the survival is longer because the host endothelium is preserved. And among the other cornea transplants, uh, endothelial keratoplasty survival is better than uh, regrafts and primary PK. So some of the common emergencies that you come across, one is the post-operatively, especially in the early post-op period, you can have a non-healing or a persistent epithelial defect. Uh, management of this identification and management is important because if not, it can result in stromal melt and perforation and also predisposes to secondary infection. Now, why does this occur? It can occur if there is already a pre-existing limbal stem cell deficiency, especially in eyes with chronic allergic eye disease, or if there is reduced corneal sensation or some element of neurotrophy, if there is a scar resulting from herpetic infection and you do a corneal transplant, or if there is a lid malaposition, either an entropion or an ectropion, which prevents the resurfacing of the tear film, you can have this kind of a problem. Management, yes, you, from a simple application of bandage contact lens to doing uh, punctal cautery or doing tarsarafi combined with amniotic membrane transplantation, depending on the severity and the type of problem that you see, you have to treat that. And you have to also address the underlying condition that results in this uh, to improve the epithelial healing. And also you have to provide antibiotic cover to prevent any secondary infection. The other problem, especially with the lamellar grafts where you use air or gas tamponade, or especially with DALC, if you have had a perforation, sometimes you do a, uh, air fill to prevent a double anterior chamber. You can have this pupillary block where the air migrates to behind the iris, resulting in a raised intraocular pressure. If not managed, this can result in development of peripheral anterior synechia, and it can also uh, damage the optic nerve. So to prevent that, you can do a prophylactic inferior PI during the surgery or dilate the pupil post-op to avoid this scenario. And if not treated, it can also result in what is referred to as the red Zavalia syndrome, where you can have a fixed dilated pupil, and uh, in a phakic eye, you can develop lens opacities as well. Once you see that, you have to, uh, you know, treat, you have to remove that air bubble and reform the anterior chamber. You can have raised IOP also resulting from the frequent use of topical steroids. So it's important that you see your patient in the first one or two weeks after surgery, because again, in a steroid responder, the pressures can go very high. You can have raised IOP also secondary to uh, uh, hemorrhage from the iris, so if you have blood in the AC or if you have severe inflammation resulting from the sinicolysis that we commonly perform, uh, you can have increased IOP. And uh, this is also important to manage because it's, not detri it's detrimental to the health of the endothelium. Sutures, yes, not in the immediate post-op, but yes, in the uh, early post-op or late post-op, sutures can break. In the early post-op, uh, sutures can become loose or they can develop the sterile infiltrates or sometimes even you can get infective infiltrates. So important to address that, especially patients who have active lid margin uh, disease like severe uh, mebomitis postoperatively. The broken or loose sutures can bring in blood vessels which can result in a graft rejection episode. And if it is associated with any, any uh, you know, debris or mucus accumulation, you can get secondary infection, melts. And uh, so, even the primary corneal surgeon may not be the person who's following up the patient. When they go to follow up and a general ophthalmologist sees that, I think it's important to get the sutures removed at the right time. If you leave them loose or if they are you know, present for a long time, it can affect the long-term outcome of the graft. And often we find that patient coming back with a rejection episode and a failed graft. 
use of topical antibiotics should be started sometimes in broken sutures. If there are no infiltrates, you can step up the steroids as well because the broken sutures can lead to, uh, you know, inflammation or it can result in uh, the reje rejection episode, especially the endothelial rejection. Long term, leaving behind the sutures, if even if the patient has good vision and not bothering the patient, you can get blood vessels coming into the cornea, and especially if lamellar grafts have been done, you can get blood vessels going into that interface, which is a easy access, and that can result in lipid keratopathy. And often we see patients only presenting to us when the lipid keratopathy starts involving the visual access. We can treat them with steroids at that point of time. We can remove the offending sutures, but sometimes it leads to loss of the clarity of the graft. This is more common in patients with prior history of allergic eye disease and you have to rec you know, differentiate this from recurrence of herpetic stromal keratitis where the clinical appearance may be quite similar where you get a stromal haze and inflammation. Stromal rejection again uh, can occur with anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, again, uh, if the predisposing factor is uh, loose sutures or if patient have previous history of active sur you know, surface like chronic uh, allergic eye disease. And as I mentioned that usually the patient will come back only if they have involvement of the visual axis and a drop in the vision. Often they don't produce symptoms as much as what you see with endothelial rejection. So any kind of redness in the eye persisting or patient just, uh, you know, feeling a foreign body sensation should not be treated just by increasing the lubricants. A timely intervention by giving a little bit more steroids can effectively manage this uh, stromal rejection. And if there are any loose sutures or, uh, you know, broken sutures, they have to be removed because without removing them, just giving them steroids uh, is not really going to uh, solve the problem. Endothelial rejection is a much more uh, emergency situation because the earlier you treat, the better the outcome. Uh, uh, patients will typically have the uh, redness, sensitivity to light, visual disturbance and pain. So this is something that we explain to every patient undergoing a corneal transplant, that if you have any of these symptoms, definitely report to your local ophthalmologist or at least come back to the primary operating surgeons. Some of the symptoms are usually milder, especially if you have undergone a DSEC or a DMEC, where it, the patient may have like a subclinical features and only when you examine on slit lamp, you can see the keratic precipitates or a mild anterior uh, chamber reaction. And the keratic precipitates are limited to the graft and you don't see them on the host side. So stepping up the steroids and sometimes giving IV methylprednisolone can help reverse the rejection and uh, you know save the graft from uh, failing completely. Uh, it's also important to differentiate this from viral endotheliitis as well, where the clinical feature may look similar, but you will see the keratic precipitates both not only limited to the corneal graft, but you will see them beyond the graft as well. And if you take a proper history, maybe in the prior records, you will see that the patient had uh, you know, therapy with antivirals at some point of time. And besides treating the inflammation, when you step up steroids, it's also important to monitor the intraocular pressure. You can give oral uh, IOP lowering agents and use uh, topical agents as well. And Following that, it's important to keep the patient on a slightly higher frequency of using topical steroids, especially because now they have a reduced uh, pool of endothelial cells and you would not want to have a repeat endothelial rejection. And I find topical tacrolimus also adding to the regimen really helps and you can, you know, kind of gives you a dual advantage besides using just steroids alone. This is a nice chart depicting all the rejections that you see, the epithelial, subepithelial rejection, and you have your stromal and the endothelial rejection. The epithelial, subepithelial are quite easier to treat. They don't affect the overall health of the corneal graft. But yes, sometimes these are misdiagnosed as adenoviral or pneumolar keratitis. And although the treatment remains the same, but I think it's important uh, to differentiate from other conditions like microsporidial or herpetic or even a pseudodendrite. Infective keratitis, yes, you can get uh, typically when we do a corneal graft and unless you stain, you can miss this. You can have a patient coming back where the 
cornea looks relatively okay. There's a faint haziness on the cornea. And if you put a uh, stain, you will realize that there is a recurrence of the herpetic keratitis. Because if the primary condition had a corneal scar with vascularization, you go ahead, do a penetrating keratoplasty, and now the patient is on topical steroids. And you find that in the early post-op period, without any coverage of oral antivirals, you can get this recurrence. And this has to be identified and treated, because if you don't do that, the defect remains for a long period of time. You can have stromal involvement, stromal melt, and ultimately you can lose the graft. Uh, you treat with uh, topic, uh, topical and systemic antivirals. I usually avoid giving topical antivirals for beyond two weeks duration. Oral antiviral prophylaxis is carried on for as long as, at least for a year, if the patient can tolerate. And if there is any contraindication for systemic antivirals, you can use topical gancyclovir as well. Uh, if you don't remove sutures on time, you can definitely get infection. Broken sutures can lead to infections. But remember that, especially if you're doing, if you're doing a corneal graft, you can get infection in the early post-operative period from the donor graft itself. And if you get it in the first one week, and if it is very uh, quick with a short history, usually bacterial, and uh, if you get a delayed kind of onset, like after doing a DSEC or a DMEC, and you see an interface opacity, that's commonly uh, fungal, and people have found that candida to be a common culprit for the same. But I think early suspicion is the key factor here. And it's you get your tissue from the eye bank, you look at the notes given by the eye bank, but if you don't evaluate the tissue yourself, sometimes you can be in a problem. Because remember, the eye bank technician has looked at the graft and they have prepared the report and then they put it in the fridge. But once it comes to you, there are temperature variations. Always look for any change in the color of the medium. If you know that this is what the uh, orange color of the solution that you have, if it has turned uh, dark orange or if it has turned violet, you know that there is change in the pH and you may not be using the graft at that point of time. Increased turbidity of the medium itself also indicates that there is something wrong. So always keep a suspicion for that. And if you have, if you've done a lamellar graft and you see an infiltrate in the interface, sometimes topical therapy may not be able to access that interface very well. I feel that early removal of the donor lenticule and then treating the infection and then repeating the surgery at a later date seems to be a better option. If it is very fulminant, then you can even do an early therapeutic keratoplasty rather than waiting for the infection to spread. You can also get stromal melt for, from the, any of the earlier indications that we said, like a non-healing epithelial defect, loose sutures, or the primary condition for which the patient was being treated because of underlying systemic disease. So it's important that you suppress the inflammation, restore the integrity first, get the surface to heal, treat the systemic condition. Then you can go back and address the corneal graft. Like this is a patient underwent a dark, had a melt, and then we treated, and then finally underwent a repeat dark and sorted out. Finally, you can have trauma resulting in wound dehiscence. Uh, this is again an emergency where if you manage the condition properly, uh, it often results in the loss of the crystalline lens and the vitreous prolapse. Uh, we used to think that DALC gives you a stronger wound, but that's not the case. This is a patient who had undergone a DALC, got hit in the eye, and you had this kind of a clinical picture, was managed by the local corneal surgeon by suturing, and later on we did a secondary IL implantation, and the graft still remained very clear. So I think it depends on the uh, original amount of damage and how the patient was managed uh, primarily. Uh, in terms of the outcome of this kind of clinical scenario. So basically, to optimize graft survival, I think appropriate selection of the donor graft, meticulate intraoperative technique, use the prop appropriate prophylactic and therapeutic agents, especially immunosuppressive medications and antibiotics as and when necessary. The regular and close follow-up is very important. Uh, it's important to spend time with the patient, explaining to them all the possible things that can happen and why they need to respond very immediately, why they should have extra bottles of medication with them. Because often you find patients say that, oh, you know, I ran out of medication and this was not available, so I didn't apply those medications. And timely intervention for any kind of any of these complications. Thank you. Thank you for your patience.